Chapter 7 Within minutes, they were rolling along the road back to London, setting a brisk pace that was eating up the miles. Anne was pensive, trying to identify the emotion she was feeling. It had been a long time since she had experienced it. She suspected it might be... contentment. She turned to the Viscount, surprised that he had been quiet for so long. She frowned when she saw the disturbed expression on his face. Is something troubling you, my lord? As a matter of fact, yes, he replied. When she merely looked at him with raised eyebrows, he continued. I think you should make clear to your aunt that even if you were to catch me in a compromising situation, I would suppress the gentleman in me and refuse to do what most would consider the honourable thing. I am not such a fool as the Earl of Heath. Anne felt as though he had struck her with that statement. She felt the colour ebbing and flowing in her face, but could not come up with a suitable reply to his uncalled-for statement. She willed the tears she felt gathering in her eyes not to fall. She did not want to give him the satisfaction of knowing he had hurt her, as she was certain that had been his aim. From what I heard... The Earl and Countess have found joy with one another, but I will be sure to tell my aunt your feelings on the subject, she answered him, trying not to sound too sarcastic. There was a lengthening silence as she contemplated his words further. It does strike me as rather strange that you would escort me on this errand if you were in fear of me trying to entrap you into marriage, my lord. Her stilted tone must have finally gotten through to the Viscount, as he quickly set about trying to reassure her. No, no, my lady, I can assure you. I am not actually in fear of you trying such a stunt. I know full well that you backed out of doing it even with the Duke. But I think you should ensure your aunt understands that such a ploy would not work with me, just in case she is of a similar mind as your father. Anne looked at the Viscount, mortified. Do you actually think I won't be able to find a husband without trapping him? What do you consider to be so horrible about me that no one will want me? She could see that the Viscount was suitably horrified at the direction this conversation was heading, but she did not care to spare his feelings. I am truly sorry, Lady Anne. I did not mean to so insult you. It was just your comment about your aunt planning our nuptials that set me on edge. Clearly I spoke without thought. I beg of you to forgive me for being so mutton-headed. Anne was not fully mollified, but she could not help the watery chuckle that his words prompted. I can assure you, I have no wish for an unwilling groom, nor am I about to try to change your mind. But might I ask why you are so dead set against marriage? I am not actually so opposed to it in theory, in fact, I know that some day I will have to settle down and become leg-shackled. I would even go so far as to say if I had met you five years from now, I would be much more interested in your aunt's schemes. But I have not yet finished enjoying my life as a bachelor, and I will not allow anyone to hurry me in that direction. That is fine, my lord. I doubt I would want to be leg-shackled to an overbearing rake such as yourself, with an overinflated opinion of his own importance— I have every intention of finding a nice, quiet gentleman who is anxious to settle down to a quiet life with me. I have no desire to have to drag someone to the altar. Anne could feel the Viscount's discomfort with the turn the afternoon had taken, but she was too disappointed herself to be able to smooth it over just at the moment. She felt as though her foundations were once again being shaken. It reaffirmed her conviction that she had no one to rely on except herself. Melancholy swamped her for a moment, but she allowed herself to relax and enjoy the scenery. Within a few minutes, she was able to pull herself back from despair, and before they had travelled a couple of miles, she had allowed the familiar scenery to lull her back into a more comfortable feeling. Finally, she felt ready to resume conversing with the Viscount. "'Have you been to the theatre yet this season, my lord?' He appeared surprised by her question, but quickly responded. I have, yes, a time or two. 
It is not my very favourite activity, but it can be a pleasant way to pass the evening. What about you, my lady? Have you been to the theatre often? I have never been. My aunt does not have a box, and I have not yet been invited to join someone else in theirs. But I think I would enjoy the experience if I get to go sometime. Why is it not your favourite? The audience can be unbelievably rude. I think the players on stage have probably put a great deal of effort into preparing their parts, and yet most cannot be bothered to even watch. Not watch? Whatever do you mean? Surely that is the point of going to the theatre, is it not? Anne was unsure if you were jesting with her. I can understand why you would think so, but no, it does not seem that the well-born consider the actual production to be worthy of their attention. It seems the majority attend the theatre merely to watch each other. Anne had to laugh over his words. Well, then, it is not unlike any other event of the season, my lord, but it does seem a shame, and I still think I would like to see it for myself. I shall arrange for a box and make a group so that you can attend. Would sometime next week work for you, do you think? Or have you already accepted invitations for every evening? Anne frowned, not at his words, but at the way her unreasonable heart seemed to skip a beat at his words. She admonished herself not to be a widgeon, and quickly answered the Viscount. I would not want to put you to any more trouble than you have already done for me, my lord. That would be too kind of you. I strongly doubt there is such a thing as too kind, my dear. And it is no trouble. It is not as though I dislike the theatre, just the other patrons. And I will ensure that I like everyone in my box, so it shan't be a trial at all. Anne was doubtful over his words, but was so anxious to go that she decided not to quibble. Well, if you are sure, my lord, I will not be missish about it, but will readily admit that I would be delighted if you could arrange it and include me. You would probably have to include my aunt in the invitation, unless you have some other equally acceptable matron that you could include. Leave that all with me, he assured her. I will make sure it is highly acceptable. But you didn't say if you were engaged for every evening. I do not think we have yet accepted invitations for most of next week. My aunt likes to wait and see if we get any better offers. Anne felt the heat creeping once again into her cheeks. Does that not seem rude, my lord? I feel badly for the hostesses who are waiting to know their numbers. Your aunt is certainly not the only one with such a tactic. It is expected, I am sure, especially of the debutantes. I think the older ladies are more set on which entertainments they wish to attend, and do not need to be wishy-washy about it. Anne wrinkled her nose as she pondered his words. So you do not think we are putting anyone out overly? I very much doubt it. As you know, most of the events you attend are crowded nearly to the point of excess. It seems unlikely the hostess would be too put out if a debutante or two chose to go elsewhere. You are most likely correct. It's not as though the debutantes are all that important anyway, is it? That is where I would have to disagree with you. The debutantes are almost the entire reason for the whole farce, don't you think? The rest of the ton entertains themselves by watching as the debutantes make their curtsy to society and go about the business of contracting a husband. Do you realise there are even betting books set up in the clubs over the results of the season? Anne was horrified. Surely you are jesting, my lord. That seems terribly ill-bred. It may be ill-bred, but that does not mean it is not true, he pointed out. Are you placing bets on it? she asked, curious, before she almost shrilled. Am I in there? She almost flinched when he reached over to pat her hand, no doubt trying to offer her comfort. Do not get in a taking, my dear. I do not stoop to such bets. I have not looked at the lists, and I have not heard anyone banding your name about, but it is most likely that you are on the books as you have made your debut this season. How vulgar! was all she could think to say. She subsided into thought for a moment before she had an idea and started to chuckle. "'What have you found to amuse you now?' the Viscount demanded. "'It might be a way for my father to straighten out his finances,' she giggled. 
she recognized the incredulous expression on the Viscount's face before he joined her in laughter. You, my dear, are a bang-up gal. You had sounded so thoroughly horrified at the thought of anyone taking bets over your marital prospects. But now that you see a way to benefit from it, you think your father should participate. Was it not gambling that led him into the trouble he finds himself in in the first place? I never said it was a good idea, just that it was an idea, she protested. You are absolutely right. It would be a horrible idea, besides being unethical, since we could control the outcome. Hardly seems sporting, does it? The Viscount was still chuckling and shook his head at her words. I am undecided if you are slightly touched in your upper works, or if you are the most amazing girl I have ever had the pleasure of meeting. Anne offered him a cheeky grin. No doubt a little bit of both. She was delighted that she had managed to hide from him the depth of her hat, and that they were managing to maintain their camaraderie. Anne did enjoy the Viscount's company, but reminded herself to be on guard not to entrust him with her feelings in the future. Despite their return to comfortable companionship, Anne was relieved when they clattered back onto a street and the Viscount handed her down from his carriage in front of her aunt's house. Save me a dance at the rocks for a ball, my lady. I might be a trifle late, as I have a few things I need to do before turning up there, but I promise I shall put in an appearance. Anne couldn't decide how she felt about his words. As you could see this morning... You have already accomplished what you set out to do for me, so you need not trouble yourself about my popularity, my lord. It does not trouble me, my dear, but I now feel responsible for you, and I want to be there to ensure you are being properly treated. She lifted her eyebrows at him, but refrained from further comment. Dipping into a curtsy, she thanked him for the afternoon and hurried up the stairs. Good afternoon, my lady. Did you have a good drive? Your aunt was just wondering about you. Anne looked at the butler anxiously to try to gauge his words, but he did not seem like he was suppressing his thoughts, so she didn't think she needed to be overly concerned about her aunt's reaction. The Viscount had been true to his word and made rapid progress returning to town, but she ought to look in on her aunt and make sure everything was all right. Where might I find her ladyship? she asked. I believe she is in her retiring room, my lady. Thank you. She hurried off to see what her aunt was doing. Oh, Anne, how lovely that you are home. I was just beginning to wonder if I should be worried. She glanced quickly at the clock on the mantel. But you have made it just in time not to have to rush in your preparations for this evening. It is a good thing we have not been invited anywhere for supper, though, she concluded on a reproving tone. I would have made certain to be back before now if we had been, Anne assured her aunt, trying not to be frustrated. Have you had a pleasant afternoon? Quite, yes, thank you for asking. Now run along and get ready. Sally should be already waiting for you in your room. Thank you, my lady. Anne curtsied and made her way out of the room. She need not have worried about her aunt's reaction to her absence. It did not seem that her ladyship was at all concerned with where she had been all afternoon. Climbing the stairs to her room, Anne contemplated the evening to come. She was quite ready to be finished with the season, as it was not turning out to be to a taste. Hopefully she would be able to come up with a plan that would allow her to not require a husband, or else she would find a suitable match within the coming days, as she was quite ready to go back to the country. Sally greeted her with warm enthusiasm. "'How was your drive with the Viscount, my lady? I did not think you would be quite so long. I do hope you didn't run into any difficulties while you were out.' Thank you for asking, Sally, and smiled at her maid. It was a lovely afternoon. We drove rather further than I had expected, which is why we were a little long. But it was so nice to get outside of the city for a time. The maid sighed. Oh, I can imagine. Anne's ready sympathy came to the fore. Are you feeling homesick, Sally? The maid blushed hotly. Oh, never mind about me, my lady. Her ladyship would not want to hear about me pining. I shan't say a word to my aunt, Sally. Have no fear. But it would be perfectly understandable if you were longing for the country. You grew up on my uncle's estate, did you not? Yes, the cook there is me mum. 
Well, then, of course you would long to be there. I do not blame you. While there are lovely parts to being in the city, for the most it is just not the right way to live. We should have fields and forests and animals all round, rather than rows and rows of houses and shops and factories. This just isn't natural, in my opinion. Sally giggled over Anne's words, but couldn't argue with them. But surely you are enjoying yourself here, though, aren't you, my lady? Going to balls and such must be lovely. Anne was suddenly struck with guilt. While she was lamenting, it was really playtime for her, whereas the maid was working constantly to make it all possible. Of course it is lovely, and I have you to thank for making it so. Now get on with you, my lady. It is all your aunt's doing. She is not the one who dresses my hair and presses my gowns. If I was not presentable, I can assure you I would not be having a good time. The maid couldn't argue with Anne's logic, so she merely giggled and got on with the business of preparing a lady for the evening. They were suddenly interrupted by the arrival of Anne's bath. Before long, there was a full tub of steaming water, and Anne sank in and allowed her worries to wash away. It didn't take too long before she was ready for the ball. A footman had delivered a tray of food for her to enjoy, rather than taking the time for a proper meal in the dining room, since they were all going out that evening. Anne was relieved she would not have to try to make conversation until later. Glancing at her reflection before heading out the door, she was surprised to see that she looked rather well. Once again, she would not be the homeliest girl in attendance, for which fact she would be eternally grateful. She wasn't sure what it was, but her adventures with the Viscount of Brackendale seemed to be agreeing with her, despite the danger to her heart. She braced her shoulders and prepared to face another ball.